Well, we come to the focal point of the Lord's tapestry as he's uh, working through uh, from Eden and moving on towards a new earth, a new heaven, and a new Jerusalem. And so uh, let's just come before him and ask him to help us as we look at this today. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your grace and your goodness. We realize, Father, that without grace, uh, we would be without hope. And so, Father, uh, we praise you for that wonderful hope that we have, not an uncertain thing, but, Father, an absolutely certain thing, that we will be with our Savior forever. And so, Father, as we come to you this morning, we just pray that you would give us help once again as we think about your word. We pray that you would bring it home to our hearts and that as a result, we might be changed and more like the Lord Jesus. We ask it in his wonderful name. Amen. Amen. So, as uh, we have uh, been looking at things, we have uh, come on this long journey. And it has been a long journey apart from, I'm not sure how long it was from the time that Adam and Eve were created until they actually fell, Uh, but it's been a long journey since they fell to this point. And it's a record of failure the whole way, isn't it? And so as we have seen God at work and God putting in place uh, all of the infrastructure Uh, for what he wants to do eventually. Uh, We come now to the very central portion of what he wants to do, and we're going to see the cross, and we're going to see the law ended. And so we are still in this dispensation number five, dispensation of the law. But as we move forward, uh, we are going to see this development. We We were in Babylon, and uh, there has been those 400 years of the Lord's silence. That's not inactivity, it's just silence, because he was very active, and he was preparing the way for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so he moved nations around, the Romans were building roads, the Greek language was becoming a common language, all of these things that were in preparation for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so God was very active. He just wasn't speaking uh, to his people during this time. And so we move from Babylon and we see the return uh, from Babylon to Judah and Ezra. We'll not read the verses. They're up there. You can read them. And then we see the return of Nehemiah and uh, as he came back to rebuild the city. Uh, so the temple and the city were, were built. And uh, then we come past those 400 years uh, of silence where the Lord is not speaking directly or through prophets or through anyone else to the people. And now we come into the New Testament and we come to this book of Matthew. And uh, we've heard much about the book of Matthew and I appreciate that because it saves me a lot of time. And and, uh, you'll remember uh, many of the things that uh, a brother said about Matthew, and we'll be keying in on some portions of it. And so, of course, we're now in the place where the Lord Jesus is born. Uh, in this uh, time, the 400 years, uh, Judah's restored to the land. <coughs> I'm going to check my time. When do we finish this one? 11.35. Okay. Uh, Judah's restored to the land. The people have been cured of idolatry and uh, their relationship with God is increasingly cold and careless. It's during this time that the, uh, the whole organization of the Pharisees, etc., develops and becomes that which is in place in the time of the Lord Jesus. Uh, there's, of course, hope that God gives as you read uh, in places like Malachi, and uh, he talks there about the sun of righteousness arising. Uh, but the nation becomes Luami, and that means not my people. 
And so uh, God is not speaking now to them. But then when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son. And uh, Christ, we will see, uh, as we have heard already, we just want to emphasize little bits of it. He offered the kingdom to the nation. Uh, so he's not offering uh, that which is an individual salvation at this point. He is offering salvation to the nation, to Israel. And so as we read through Matthew and we see that offer of the kingdom, it is an offer to the nation, uh, which uh, again is important because when God was dealing with the Jews, he sets them aside because of the refusal of the kingdom and the refusal of the king, and he sets them aside as a nation. And then eventually when he's going to work with them again, he uh, reactivates them as a nation. And so we have 1948 and following and all the things that are going to come thereafter. And so, as we have already mentioned, he entered Jerusalem 483 years to the day and received and accepted the adulation that was befitting a king. Of course, uh, these people were just out it appears, without real understanding of what was going on. And so, in a sense, it was a little bit of a street party for them. Uh, and very soon, within the next day or two, they have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, uh, they uh, register the rejection of him in unbelief. And so, that's where we are. Uh, of course, in Luke, it tells us, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. He shall be great and be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So again, that uh, where we saw with Daniel and the prophecies given to Daniel, all this talk now about kingdoms and the king, uh, now we are even getting more after this 400 years of God uh, being silent in, and not speaking, uh, now we are again starting to talk about a king and a throne. And so it says, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And so it's very obvious what the Lord uh, is doing as we move into what we call the New Testament. And so the primary purpose, just a review of Matthew's gospel, is to convince the Jews uh, that the Jesus in whom they had believed really was their long-awaited Messiah. Uh, I put here Jewish believers. I think they were the ones who were convinced. Uh, you know, you see those who were waiting for the Messiah. And uh, we think uh, uh, when he was born and brought for circumcision, and, and we think of those who were in the temple and they had been waiting for the Messiah, Anna, etc., and Simeon. And so to explain to Jewish believers why the kingdom had not come, so we're talking now about believers uh, who are there in place as uh, they, uh, understand, they have seen the king. They have, some of them have recognized who he is, that he is the king, that he is the Messiah, obviously a small group among the whole of the nation. Uh, but certainly, uh, when they recognize the king, they must be thinking, why is the kingdom not coming in? Why doesn't he establish it? And so again, Matthew explains why there is no establishment of the kingdom at that time. And then, as well as that, as we go on in Matthew, we find uh, the explanation of God's interim program. That doesn't mean unimportant, it doesn't mean plan B, but it does mean that God had a plan. And of course, uh, the core of that plan is the church in this interim period until the nation who has been set aside for a time uh, comes into God's plans again to be dealt with again. And of course, we see that at the time of the tribulation. So. Uh, Matthew's account of the king, uh, as a brother has opened up, the whole of Matthew is a Jewish book. 
It is, if you like, a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, it uh, takes the prophecies of the Old Testament and makes them very uh, present in what it talks about now as we enter this, what we think of as the New Testament period. We will see the king rejected, uh, and uh, we will be having a look at Matthew 12 shortly. And so there's the rejection of the king the kingdom. And then, of course, we've talked about the triumphal entry, and he's rejected. So what's, why rejection and rejection? Well, in Matthew 12, we'll see that this is uh, embodied in the Pharisees, who are the leaders and the rulers of the nation. And so in Matthew 12, you have this rejection uh, because they attributed the work of the Lord Jesus to Satan, to Beelzebub. And uh, so at that particular point, we have what's called the unpardonable sin and attributing uh, the very evident work of the Spirit uh, to Satan. And so there's that point of rejection, and we'll see how that works out. Uh, but then, of course, the Lord keeps teaching. And uh, as he goes through that, then he comes to this time uh, that we call the triumphal entry. And uh, as we've mentioned, the people give him adulation, and then basically within a short time are calling for his crucifixion. And so uh, the, the Lord is going through this whole process. Difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of grace. Now, some of these slides, by the way, uh, there's a bunch of information packed in them. Uh, a couple of folks have asked, uh, is it possible to get these? And so I have no problem getting them. Uh, I have no problem with you having them. I have a problem getting them to you because the files seem to be so long. I've tried to uh, send files like this. So if you want them, actually, I'll leave maybe a sheet up on the table. And if you want them, you can leave an email address. But you won't have all these slides until probably a month or more down the road because of stuff we've coming up. And when I get away to compact it all and, and send it to you. So anyway, he, we're not going to deal with this in detail. I just want you to notice uh, the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of grace. Uh, we have biblical examples, but the target audiences are different. And so uh, for the gospel of the kingdom, it's to national Israel. But to the gospel with which we're familiar, it's to all nations and all people. Okay? And then the type of salvation for the Jews it would be a national salvation. And the kingdom would come in and the king would be there, and they would have a political entity, uh, which uh, if we follow uh, the descriptions of that kingdom in the Old Testament particularly, we find it would be a time of absolute peace, it would be a time of righteous rule, it would be a time when there was actual physical differences in the topography of the land, uh, with the light of the sun, all of these things. And so it would be focused on the nation of Israel. But when it comes to salvation, the gospel of grace, it is personal. It's individual. And so we'll not go through all of these. Uh, but uh, here, uh, if you want these, eventually is actually two pages of differences. Uh, that's the second page of them. Uh, the differences between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of grace. But the key thing is that the gospel of the kingdom is to the nation Israel, specifically as a nation, and the gospel of which we think is individual, uh, where we individually place our trust in the Lord Jesus. So we've emphasized, Warren has mentioned it, I've mentioned it, uh, that the kingdom as you find it in scripture, is very physical. It is something you can reach out and touch. It would be something that you could walk around in. Uh, it is on earth. And as we mentioned, uh, Reformed theology tends to think that this is a spiritual kingdom in place now with the, the king on the throne uh, in heaven. 
and certainly that's where he is, and he does occupy a throne, uh, but uh, the, it doesn't match up with the idea of the scriptures that this is a physical kingdom, and it's all centered in Israel. Uh, now, we'll explain how we're part of the kingdom, and how uh, people who come to know the Lord Jesus as their savior will be part of the kingdom, but this is Jewish, this is Israel, and it is a promise to Israel. And so uh, Ryrie, he asked the question, why is an earthly kingdom necessary? And he asked the question, uh, basically, that is the basis of the thinking of, uh, of Reformed theology, says, did he not receive his inheritance when he was raised and exalted in heaven? Is not his present rule his inheritance? Why does there need to be an earthly kingdom? Then he answers, because he, that is God, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, must be triumphant in the same arena where he was seemingly defeated. And so that, uh, when Satan came and stole the kingdom, that was on earth. And so it's uh, like a return match and uh, God will deal in the same arena uh, with the problem that was created. His rejection by the rulers of this world was on this earth. Talks about that in that reference in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8. His exaltation must also be on this earth. And so it shall be when he comes again to rule this world in righteousness. He has waited long for his inheritance. Soon he shall receive it. And so the kingdom is an earthly kingdom. As Warren went over, it was prepared for by John the Baptist preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent. Uh, the Lord Jesus comes and he begins to preach and says he preaches the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, as we see him moving among the people, we see his compassion for them. And it says he went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And uh, then we see the agents of the king, that's the 12 and then the 70, and again, they are sent out to preach that same gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, and the Lord restricts who they would preach that gospel to, and he says, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So we get this uh, whole program that the Lord comes to fulfill. But then we get to Matthew 12, and let's turn there. And it's in Matthew 12, as we've mentioned, that we have this turning point. And at this turning point, it is because he has been rejected by the nation, represented uh, by the leaders of the nation. And uh, as you come into chapter 12, you find uh, as you move down, uh, for instance, in verse 22 and following, uh, it's the accusation that the Lord has done what he has done by the power of Beelzebub. And it talks about the uh, unforgivable sin in uh, verse 31, uh, moving on. And then uh, as we move down to verse 38, uh, they're not content with uh, denigrating the Lord, uh, but now they want a sign. And of course, the emphasis in Scripture is that the Jews always wanted a sign. It talks about that in 1 Corinthians, doesn't it? They wanted a sign, and the Lord uh, wasn't going to give them a, a specific sign. He simply uh, gave them, uh, or took their attention back to Jonah. And uh, of course, they probably didn't know what he was talking about. But that was the sign that he gave them. And he talked about the Queen of the South uh, who came and uh, they were, uh, she saw Solomon all his glory. And he says, behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So that takes us down then to a place where there's a man with an unclean spirit or had had an unclean spirit. And uh, when we get down to 46, uh, 
the Lord uses that story of the unclean spirit, uh, whether he's talking about a specific person or not, uh, or whether he's simply using that as, a, as, a, as an illustration, you can decide. But when we get to 46, it says, While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. And one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. And he answered and said to them and to, uh, to him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? Now this is the gracious, kindly Lord Jesus Christ. And on the face of it, he brushes off his, his family. And uh, on the face of it is uh, somewhat rude to his mother. Uh, but that's not what's going on here. Because we are about to see the change uh, in what's going on. And as, as we see this change, it says, he stretched uh, forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. And what we have here is the indication of a change in dispensation. And uh, the first verses of chapter 13 have to do with it also. The same day when Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So, as we uh, think about these few verses, what is actually going on? And I would suggest to you that the Lord is talking not about his mother and his brethren specifically, but he's talking about what is going to come and that is, when the gospel of grace comes, it will be those who believe and who uh, walk in faith in him. And the actions in chapter 13, 1 and 2, are very, very, I would suggest, notable. The same day when Jesus out of the house. Now, he was literally in a house. And so there's a literal and immediate uh, understanding of that. He went out of the house and he literally went down to the water. But there is also a, a dispensational application here because if you think of the word house in terms of, for instance, the house of Israel, the house of David, it also represents, in this case, I would suggest, the house of Israel, and it is a symbolic uh, action that indicates that he is leaving the nation, uh, that there is going to be a change in his relationship with the nation. He has offered them the kingdom, and they have refused the kingdom, and therefore he leaves the house. And as well as that, when you come into the scriptures, you find very often uh, that, uh, the, uh, uh, that the sea represents uh, the Gentile nations. You go into the book of Revelation and it occurs regularly there. And so this move, this actual action of him leaving a physical house and going down to the seaside, dispensationally, I would suggest is him leaving uh, for the moment the house of Israel and the indication that what is coming will focus particularly on the Gentile nations that are symbolized by the sea that he goes down to. And so now when you have this change, uh, now you're going to see his ministry take on a different flavor there is no more gospel of the kingdom uh, as you move on in Matthew. But what do you have? Well, you get, for instance, into chapter 16, and uh, you uh, find him saying, I say unto thee, uh, Peter, 
Upon this rock I will build my church. So he's been rejected as king. The kingdom's been rejected. And uh, we'll be using the word postponed because the kingdom isn't done with. But it's postponed because of the rejection. And once again, uh, we'll see the kingdom later in world history. Uh, but for the moment now, the Lord Jesus says, I am going to build my church, my ecclesia, my assembly. Now that means that, number one, he used the word my, that's possessive. It is his church. And of course, as we go on in the epistles, we find the church is his body, etc. And he says it in the future, I will build. This is not something that has been there before. This is something brand new. And so the Lord Jesus indicates uh, that he is going to be doing something new. And we'll not go to other verses, but we see uh, teaching, uh, the beginnings of teaching with regards to the church. Now let's go over to the book of John. And it's also chapter 12. Now we see in John in chapter 12, the Lord at a different point in his ministry. This is very shortly before his uh, crucifixion, but we have a similar sort of uh, indication uh, as he teaches in uh, verse 23. The Lord says, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And he goes on with this teaching. And down in verse 27, he says, now it, now this isn't the Garden of Gethsemane. He's teaching here and he says, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. You know, I believe that the prospect of the cross was so much on the mind of the Savior in these last days before the cross uh, that he's constantly thinking about it and realizes exactly uh, what it all means to him. And uh, here he is uh, mentioning this. And then as uh, we get to verse 37, I would suggest that this is the fulcrum point, just as chapter 12 and the beginning of 13 in Matthew was that fulcrum point uh, where it changed from the offer of the kingdom to something different. Now we have this again, and it says, though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. And then we have the same pattern again that we had in Matthew. In Matthew, he started to talk about my church. And what do we have in John? Well, once we passed chapter 13, we have 14, 15, 16, and 17, the upper room ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he lays out for the disciples exactly what's going to happen when he leaves and the Spirit comes and the church is born. Okay. And so uh, the kingdom is now in abeyance. It's postponed. Uh, the rejection uh, of the king and the kingdom brought a stop. It's kind of like, I don't know much about basketball, but I think they have timeouts, don't they? When the play stops and they hit the clock and, and the time stops. And that's exactly what it is with the kingdom the rejection often brought the clock to a stop. The clock isn't finished with. The clock will be started again uh, when God uh, moves to actually allow the kingdom to be brought in. And so we have this wonderful picture of the one who is about to go to the cross, and he's very aware of what he's doing, and we'll demonstrate that in just a moment or two, he knows exactly what he's doing, and he knows exactly what the Father wants, and so he is communicating what the Father wants. Just by the way, back in Matthew, in that chapter 12, if we've gone through, we see in that chapter the Lord portrayed as priest, prophet, and king. 
in those verses. And I would suggest to you that it's no accident that here in the place of his rejection uh, in, the, in the book of Matthew, he is pictured in these three characteristics of priest, prophet, and king. Uh, and it is that that the Jewish nation has now rejected, at least in the meantime. So we have this interim age now, this interim age from the time the clock stops till the clock starts again. And the king has been rejected. Is it the end of the king and the kingdom? Well, obviously it's not. Uh, we'll not go over the verses. You can look them up. Uh, and then we have Christ's parable in Luke chapter 19. And we'll not go through the parable, but I want you to notice a couple of things about it. In verse 11 in chapter 19, it says, As they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was near to Jerusalem. And notice, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Okay? So there's still this expectation of the kingdom to appear now. And uh, uh, the parable is all about the fact that it's not coming right now. And it's in this parable that the Lord indicates that those that he's talking about, and obviously it's a picture of the nation, it's there in verse 14, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so uh, again, uh, this indication that the Lord is making very clear, the nation has rejected what he came to offer from God. And so the kingdom's postponed. And then uh, some of you have probably wondered about Matthew 13, uh, which we call the parables of the kingdom. Now, how does that all fit in? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that Matthew 13 is the spiritual conditions. I have, oh, it's kind of hard to read. But the spiritual conditions that will prevail during the absence of the king, the one who is king. Uh, just because he was rejected doesn't mean he's not a king. And so it's the spiritual conditions that will prevail in this interim period in which we are during the absence of the king. And that's what those uh, parables are all about. And it talks about the gospel and the spread of the gospel and the opposition to the gospel, etc., etc., etc. So what about you and me? Uh, have we any part in this kingdom? Well, can I point you to uh, chapter 13 and uh, verse 27? Sorry, I got the wrong. I'm still in chapter 12. Chapter 13 and uh, verse 38. 1338, and this is in the parable of the tares. But here it says, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The word there actually is not so much children. There's actually another Greek word that is better used when it's talking about children, but it, it really means the sons of the kingdom. And so uh, the word is quios, and uh, it talks about sons. And so the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. And so in a very real sense, when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, even though the kingdom is not physically present, we become, if you like, part of the kingdom that will eventually be here. And we will see, of course, that the church reigns with Christ. And uh, in uh, sort of trying to uh, put it in a way that we can understand, uh, if you like, we become the administrators of the earth under the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ as we return to the earth with him. And so, in a sense, we, it ties in somewhat with the idea uh, that we are strangers and pilgrims. Yeah, we belong to a kingdom that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will be revealed, 
and we will definitely be a very physical part of that. Uh, but at the same time, as we have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, we have, if you like, become sons of the kingdom. We have our citizenship. We have our responsibility now as ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ in a foreign place because we are here in this world that is not our home. And so can I suggest that that's uh, an idea or a way to understand how we relate to the kingdom right now. It is not a matter of bringing in the kingdom. It is not a matter of being, uh, there's all sorts of phrases out there uh, that people want to use to talk, make us kingdom people and bring in the kingdom, etc. But certainly in our salvation, we become sons of the kingdom. And uh, we have this tremendous privilege. So uh, the only thing I want you to mention here is at the bottom, or want to mention is at the bottom, the concept of a kingdom postponed must be understood as a postponement from the human side. Okay, it's not that God got caught out and said, oh, we got got to hit the clock here. No, no, God knew exactly what he was doing. And so it, it, this is our perspective as we see it, as we're looking at what's happening in world history. It is from our point of view and not from God's point of view. I'm really bad on these times. Okay, we've got five minutes. Okay, and so uh, part of this interim age, of course, is the church age, as uh, we see uh, the Lord at work in the church today. We can mention that later. But what I want to point uh, to right now is back in John chapter 12. And it's in the context of all that we have talked about in the last 30 minutes or so that this is said. So in John uh, chapter 12, we suggested that 37 was the fulcrum point, the change from one thing to the other. Uh, but in John chapter 12 and verse 31, the Lord Jesus makes this pronouncement. Now is the judgment of this world, and now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And so, obviously, he's talking about his crucifixion, because in verse 32, he says, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So he's talking about his work on the cross, and he says, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And so when we uh, look at this, uh, the idea here uh, of Satan being cast out, I believe, is in contrast uh, to what the Lord says in chapter 6 and uh, verse 37. And you'll remember there that he says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Amen. But here is Satan, and it says, now the prince of this world shall be cast out. And so, again, God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is dealing with this situation, not only for the salvation of man, but also to retain and, and retake the kingdom. And so when we get to, uh, to John chapter 19, and verse 30, I'm sure some of you can know already what verse that is. Can you repeat that again? John 19 and verse 30. We have the Savior on the cross. And uh, his word is, it is finished. And of course, we rightly apply that to the work of uh, providing salvation and redemption. Uh, but... I would suggest to you that it also encompasses the work that is being done to retake the kingdom. And like many things in Scripture, it talks about something accomplished that in time it hasn't actually happened yet. But it's as though it's as good as done. Okay? 
And it is as good as done. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ says, now the prince of this world shall be cast out, it's as good as done, even though we see that he continues on. And I made the analogy the other day about uh, being out on bail between the time of his conviction and the time of the implementation of his sentence. And so, but it's done. At the cross, it's done. And uh, the Lord uh, eff effectively has retaken the kingdom as well as having provided salvation. I, I would suggest too that it goes even beyond that. It is the absolute completion of the, everything that the Father asked him to do. doesn't matter what it was, whether it was in regard to uh, training the disciples, laying the foundation for the church, absolutely everything in the work of the Lord Jesus, it is finished. I want you to notice too, uh, as you look at Matthew 27 and the Lord on, on the cross there, In, uh, in verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But look what it said back in John, when we read it in John, when he said it is finished. It doesn't say he cried out. It was just a simple, he said, it's finished. <clears throat> I wonder if there wasn't a sense of relief in that for the Savior. That in perfect obedience to the Father, he had done it all. And as he's bowing his head, because that's the picture, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it's finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It's done. All this suffering, all this work that I've had to do for the Father, uh, not because of obligation, but because of loving obedience to the Father, it's done. What a picture. And so we'll finish there for now, and we'll continue, and we'll see the institution of the kingdom tonight. Questions? Thoughts? Are you the 